In 1912, unearthed in an English gravel bed was the fossil discovery of a lifetime. It was certified as the missing link, a skull that made the evolutionary connection between ape and man. The Piltdown Man held up for nearly 40 years until he was found to be a fraud. Reputations were destroyed, scientific credibility was doubted. Who would perpetuate such a hoax and why is one of the great mysteries of our times. We will now go in search of history to scrutinize the hoax of the ages Piltdown Man. The Natural History Museum, London. Among its many treasures, there once resided the fossilized bones of the missing link. Alternately called Eoanthropus, or Piltdown Man, the half a million year old skull was presented as the last earthly remains of a half man, half ape. A being exactly midway up the evolutionary ladder between animals and humans. Found in the gravel bed of a Sussex farm, the Piltdown skull was known by proud Londoners as the earliest Englishman. But much to the chagrin of British science, Piltdown Man was not what he seemed to be. The tale begins in 1908, at least according to a country solicitor and amateur scientist named Charles Dawson. A laborer had brought Dawson a curiously shaped piece of fossilized bone he had discovered in a gravel pit near the village of Piltdown, south of London. Dawson eventually went to the site himself and found more pieces of the fossil. It was Dawson who realized that this bone was profoundly significant. As he suspected, the bones were part of an ancient human skull. The skull was enormously thick, at least twice as thick as a modern human skull, a clear sign of its primitive origins. Dawson believed he might have uncovered the long-awaited proof for the theory of evolution. Still controversial more than 50 years after Charles Darwin wrote The Origin of Species in 1859. Darwin's follow-up book, The Descent of Man, was even more explicit in its heresy, saying that human beings and apes had evolved from a common ancestor. His speculation that the human species evolved over time ran in direct contradiction to the prevailing Judeo-Christian views of a biblical creation as set forth in the book of Genesis. Evolution was quickly embraced by the scientific community. Darwin's theory elegantly explained many of the problems and mysteries that had plagued natural scientists for centuries. Unfortunately, at the time, there was no physical evidence documenting the transition from ape to man. Though the theory made sense, the evidence was conspicuous in its absence. Fossils first found in Germany's Neander Valley, the so-called Neanderthal man, were understood as a kind of primitive early human but they were definitely not the half-ape, half-human missing link. 
When Charles Darwin revolutionized biology in 1859, there were no fossil men, no scrap, maybe a few little bits of Neanderthal, but that was all. Everybody asked, but where is the missing link that connects man with the apes? There, were, there weren't any. Eventually, some critters started turning up in France and in Germany. The British scientists, the home of evolution, were very, very jealous. If France had a Neanderthal and Germany had a Neanderthal, where was the earliest Englishman? Charles Dawson, the self-taught paleontologist without a university degree, knew he needed professional support for his discovery. He brought his precious finds to the Natural History Museum in London to the head of the geology department, Arthur Smith Woodward. Woodward was already an established paleontologist, renowned for his study of fossil fish, yet the handful of bones placed before him by Dawson were to bring him more fame than he could ever have imagined. Woodward could only stare at them. There, there were probably three little pieces. He saw immediately that the walls were twice as thick as an, uh, an ordinary human skull. I would, in fact, <laughs> bet the first thing he said to himself was, my God, here's the missing link. Woodward and Dawson returned to the site of the incredible find. Together with a local laborer, and joined occasionally by a young priest from a nearby seminary, the enthusiastic fossil hunters began to dig in the piltdown gravel with renewed fervor. Their efforts were soon rewarded with more skull fragments, and after months of searching, an ape-like fossil jawbone. The Piltdown jaw was more than Professor Woodward could ever have hoped for. Its ape-like structure seemed to confirm the theory that this creature was half ape and half man. Many other animal fossils found with the skull, such as those of a prehistoric hippopotamus, showed that the Piltdown man lived half a million years before, the oldest fossil human ever discovered. On December 18, 1912, Dawson and Woodward presented their finds at a meeting of the prestigious Geological Society in London. The unveiling of the Piltdown Man was considered to be one of the most important events in the history of science. The Piltdown remains were, were hailed as very important for a number of reasons. First of all, in terms of the cranial material, it was actually fairly complete. Here we had pieces of skull and pieces of jawbone which apparently belonged together. Because the geological dating that was put on the site was very ancient, this site might have been a million years old or older. Woodward proposed to the society that the missing link be named after the man who discovered it, Eoanthropus Dawsoni, the Dawn Man of Dawson. The discovery of Piltdown Man was not embraced by all scientists. Many were initially skeptical, suggesting that the ape-like jaw and man-like cranium were simply not related to each other. But then Dawson and Woodward were vindicated by further digging at the Piltdown site. A large canine tooth uncovered nearby proved the ape-like structure of the primitive man's jaw. Crudely fashioned flints found in the same pit established that the creature was a tool maker. Two years later, in a nearby field, cranium fragments and a molar tooth were uncovered that were nearly identical to the first Piltdown skull. This was all the confirming evidence the scientific world needed. Piltdown man, Eoanthropus Dawsoni, was unquestioningly accepted as the oldest ancestor of humanity. It was received ecstatically. There was a large 
and a still slightly continuing debate about the validity of the idea that humans and apes are related or that humans are descended from a former fossil ape. And at that time, the um, controversies were even stronger than they are today. There were people were on one side or the other. The press loved it because they could uh, get really good stories out of the conflict between the different bodies involved. Charles Dawson cemented his reputation with discovery of fragments of a third skull in yet another field near the original site. The amateur paleontologist had vindicated evolutionary theory, had made major contributions to science, and had proven, as Englishmen had long suspected, that England was the birthplace of mankind. Charles Dawson died in 1916 at the height of his fame and glory. It would be 36 years before the shocking truth was revealed about the Piltdown Man, a revelation that would destroy professional reputations, threaten scientific careers, and call into question the very foundation of the scientific method. In 1949, a paleontologist named Kenneth Oakley was experimenting with a chemical test for determining fossil age. He decided to test it on the most important fossils in England, the Piltdown Man. To Oakley's surprise, the famous skull seemed to be 450,000 years younger than previously thought. Suspicions aroused, Oakley went on to test the second Piltdown skull, only to discover it was nowhere to be found. Piltdown 2, the skull that confirmed the existence of the missing link, had somehow disappeared. The mystery of the Piltdown skull perplexed scientists for the next four years. One of the scientists most disturbed by Oakley's discovery was a young anthropologist named Joseph Weiner. He asked the question no one had previously thought to ask. What if the entire Piltdown discovery was a fraud? Weiner brought his concerns to the head of the anthropology department at Oxford, who immediately called Professor Oakley. So they telephoned Oakley Oakley couldn't quite believe what he heard them saying on the telephone because it was all new to him, but they convinced him, go and take a look at this stuff and call us right back. He did. It took about an hour or whatever it was. He called back and he said, my God, there are abrasions on the teeth which were obviously made by a metal instrument. That was the beginning of the end of Piltdown. It took only a cursory examination to discover evidence of a hoax. File marks on the teeth could be seen with a microscope, and some even with the naked eye. The large jaw was not an ancient hominid's, but a modern orangutan's. Simply chipping its surface revealed the modern bone under the fraudulent fossilization process. The teeth in the jaw had been filed flat to resemble human teeth, and their surfaces were completely out of alignment. The huge, fang-like canine tooth had simply been covered with artist's paint, the color Van Dyke Brown. The evidence of fraud was not hard to find. The question many asked, was why it had never been seen before. One of the interesting things about the Piltdown story is the way it exposes human psychology. Piltdown was believed in the first place because the scientists especially wanted to believe it. Brett 
Britain's August Natural History Museum is all a dither over a scandal concerning the Piltdown Man. One of the most famous fossil skulls in the world is declared to be in part a hoax. The death of the Piltdown Man had a profound effect on the scientific world. Scholars and scientists had built their entire careers on the Piltdown fossils. Reputations were destroyed, textbooks had to be rewritten, and the entire theory of human evolution was shaken to its roots. With Piltdown, someone had made a monkey out of science. The question was, who? The suspects are legion, the clues innumerable, the motives obscure. Yet for 40 years, someone had pulled the wool over the eyes of the best scientists in the world. Who was the culprit behind the Piltdown hoax? I will give you his name without hesitation and without making you wait. Charles Dawson was the perpetrator alone, by himself, without the least bit of help. He did it. He did it all by himself. Dawson very much wanted fame. He was already a fellow of the Geological Society, and he wanted desperately to be a fellow of the Royal Society. And I think that this was part of his self-enhancement, as it were. He was really a, a con man of some sort and a very plausible man, the way that con men are. According to this theory, Dawson had come into possession of a very thick human skull. Though it was only a few hundred years old, he chemically treated and stained the bones to make them look ancient. Then he brought the skull fragments to his friend, the head of geology at the Natural History Museum. Taking advantage of Woodward's enthusiasm, Dawson set up a series of archaeological digs in the gravel beds of Piltdown. He treated more bone fragments with chemicals and placed them in the gravel so that his partners could find them. When it seemed that his colleagues did not notice the carefully revealed bones, Dawson had to point them out himself. For many in the scientific community, the mystery of Piltdown was solved the moment that the hoax was discovered. Charles Dawson, the non-scientist, had played a prank on science. Yet questions remain. How could an untrained country lawyer have created a skull that fooled the best anthropologists in the world for 40 years? How did an amateur fossil hunter manage to create dozens of pieces of evidence and solicit the support of the great museums and scientific bodies in Europe? The Piltdown Man discovery quickly fell apart under scrutiny. Further study revealed that the skull apparently was from a medieval man, and the jaw came from a 15th century orangutan that had died in the East Indies. The hoax was confirmed by researchers at a meeting of the Geological Society in 1953. The scientific community was quick to condemn the amateur Charles Dawson as the culprit. Sir Arthur Keith, who had built his scientific career on the Piltdown Man, felt betrayed by the seemingly brilliant amateur and was adamant in condemning him. Keith wrote in a letter to another scientist, I have no doubt that Dawson was the author of all the fraud. The man I had the greatest reverence for had deliberately misled his best friend, Smith Woodward, and me.
Was Keith simply bitter about being hoaxed? According to some modern scholars, Sir Arthur's anger might have been an attempt to cover his own tracks. Startling clues are provided in Keith's own diary entry of December 20th, 1912. This has been an exciting week. The famous meeting of the Geological Society on the 18th. I write leader for the British Medical Journal on the meeting Monday night. On Wednesday, wrote account for Morning Post. Here in a seemingly unremarkable diary entry lies perhaps an outright admission of Keith's involvement in the hoax. Keith speaks of the meeting on the 18th, the very meeting where the Piltdown Man was first announced to the world. But the 18th of December was a Wednesday, and Keith admits that he'd already written the article announcing the discovery on the previous Monday, two days before he was supposed to have learned of it. Sir Arthur Keith's subsequent behavior seems suspicious as well. When the hoax was revealed 40 years after the fact, it was discovered that Keith had destroyed all his correspondence with Charles Dawson. The crime would have gone something like this. Keith and Dawson had met sometime before 1911 and created the plan for the Piltdown Man. Keith's motive was simple. He believed that humans had evolved a large brain well before they evolved other human-like features. The combination of ape-like jaw and human-like skull would help establish Keith's theory, which was being undermined by the discovery of small-brained Neanderthal fossils. Pretending to be an outsider, Keith's unqualified support of the bones seemed to authenticate the hoax he himself had set up. From then on, Keith would promote the story, ostensibly from the sidelines, writing articles and books which gave credence and respectability to the Piltdown Man, and gaining fame for himself in the process. But for some aficionados of the Piltdown story, there's an even more likely candidate with an even more unlikely reputation. Father Pierre Thiard de Chardin is considered one of the foremost Catholic philosophers of the 20th century. A Jesuit priest and a trained anthropologist, Thiard wrote one of the most important works of theology in the century the phenomenon of man. The time has come to realize that an interpretation of the universe remains unsatisfying unless it covers the interior as well as the exterior of things, mind as well as matter. The true physics is that which will, one day, achieve the inclusion of man in his wholeness in a coherent picture of the world. The young priest Tiard was an unknown anthropology student when he assisted his friend Charles Dawson at the Piltdown gravel pits in 1912. He was one of only four men actually present at the discovery. Another damning piece of evidence is that Tiard found the most controversial piece of bone by himself, out of sight of the others, a discovery recalled by Professor Woodward in his autobiography. We were excavating a rather deep trench in which Father Tiard was especially energetic. Very soon he exclaimed that he had picked up the missing canine tooth, but we were incredulous. So we both left our digging to verify his discovery. There could be no doubt about it.
What made the discovery even more remarkable was that it was in a gravel bed that Professor Woodward had finished searching just moments before. Why would a priest have committed such a fraud? Was it an attempt to further his anthropological career? Or was Tiar himself a victim of Dawson? In the 1970s, two decades after the exposure of the Piltdown hoax, a forgotten trunk in a musty attic of Britain's Natural History Museum may have provided the solution to the mystery of Piltdown. One of my friends in the museum said to me, Brian, have you ever seen the stuff that I found in the trunk up in the Southwest Tower? And I said, no. He went down and showed it to me. In the trunk was something like 10 stained bones of uh, elephant teeth and a hippopotamus and so on. But some of them, not only were they stained identically in color to the Piltdown fragments, but they'd actually, some of them had been whittled and they matched the whittling found on the last discovered specimen in Piltdown. Could this trunk of stained bones provide the missing clues to the Piltdown case? No one had to look far to find out who the trunk belonged to. The initials were right on top, M-A-C-H, for Martin Alastair Campbell Hinton. Hinton had been the head of the museum's zoology department for decades. Hinton was not associated with the Piltdown discovery in 1912, or so it seemed until the suspicious trunk of treated bones was discovered long after his death. To some scholars, these bones are clear evidence of Hinton's participation in the hoax. He was using them as an experiment, clearly. I put them through an auto-analyzer, saw what the contents of the bone stains were, and they had exactly the same stains as in the Piltdown material, as in all the skull bones and so on. They were mainly iron, some small amount of manganese, and small amounts of chromium. So this was the same stains as in the Piltdown remains. What possible motive could Hinton have had to provoke this bizarre prank? The answer may lie in the world of academic and scientific rivalry. Martin Hinton carried a professional grudge against Professor Woodward, his superior at the Natural History Museum. Woodward had once hired Hinton to catalog specimens from the museum's collection, only to refuse to pay him later. Hinton apparently despised Woodward for the rest of his career. Was the Piltdown hoax a cruel prank meant to embarrass a professional rival? And if it was, perhaps it succeeded too well. I think it was a vendetta of Hinton's making with Arthur Smith Woodward. He found Arthur Smith Woodward an arrogant, bumptious character. Uh, he thought, I will get my own back on him. He didn't know Arthur Smith Woodward would fall for the joke. He must have, must have found it hilarious. I mean, it, it, it got more and more ludicrous as time went on. If this scenario is true, the point of the hoax was to embarrass Arthur Smith Woodward. The hoaxer apparently never imagined that anyone would accept the crude fakes as actual fossils. Even as an old man, long after the hoax had been revealed, Martin Hinton seemed to take a great deal of satisfaction and amusement in the story of the Piltdown Man. My colleague, Bob Savage, would take him of an evening, just like Harrison Matthews would, and buy him drinks and give him port and try and get him inebriated and admit to it. But he would never admit to it to Bob Savage, but he did admit that he had been at Piltdown when most of the finds were discovered. 
The multitude of suspects and the profusion of motives and means makes the Piltdown hoax akin to some of the great detective novels of the same period. In fact, someone with one of the most curious connections to the Piltdown hoax was a mystery writer, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, creator of the great fictional detective Sherlock Holmes. Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, who was the perpetrator of the Piltdown hoax. When people tried to figure out who was the culprit at Piltdown, they would normally think, in terms of one of the scientists who was trying to build fame and glory out of the hoax, it didn't occur to anybody that maybe somebody from outside the scientific establishment was trying to embarrass the entire British scientific establishment. Arthur Conan Doyle, already famous for his Sherlock Holmes mysteries, was associated with every aspect of Piltdown. The novelist lived in the Piltdown area, just seven miles away from the discovery site. He was a personal friend of both Dawson and Professor Woodward. Conan Doyle had a degree in medicine, and had the knowledge and expertise to create the fraudulent bones. And finally, the creator of Sherlock Holmes had a reputation as an incorrigible practical joker. All that's missing is the motive, a motive that can be discovered when one looks at Conan Doyle's career outside of the literary world. Arthur Conan Doyle was a spiritualist. He believed that one could speak to the dead through mediums, Ouija boards, and seances. The spiritualist movement grew in popularity in the early part of the 20th century, and no one was more fervent in belief than the celebrated author. Perhaps the most overriding thing about Conan Doyle was that he was a spiritualist in the sense uh, that it was a, a zealousness, a fanaticism. Uh, he, he believed that this was, in the words of one of his books, the new revelation, that there, was, that there was an afterlife not as a basis of belief or theology, but as a matter of established scientific fact. He devoted his life, his fortune from the Sherlock Holmes writings to it. Though Conan Doyle's literary career remained unscathed, his reputation as a public figure suffered as a result of his highly publicized beliefs. The scientists told him he wasn't objective, he didn't understand the rules of evidence, and of course, Sir Arthur was the creator of Sherlock Holmes. You don't tell me about evidence, my dear sir. You don't tell me about objectivity and logic. Perhaps I can show you something about evidence and objectivity and logic. The author would have manufactured the questionable artifacts at his home from his well-known collection of oddities. A frequent visitor to the Piltdown golf course, no one would have found it odd if he were often seen in the area. Walking the few short yards from the Piltdown fairway to the gravel pit, Conan Doyle would have carefully salted the site with his artifacts. Having already befriended and captured the attention of the local antiquities hunter, Charles Dawson. As the prank grew in size and fame, Arthur Conan Doyle could only have relished the joke further as each of his increasingly more obvious clues went unnoticed by the purportedly objective and rational scientific establishment. Yet could the Piltdown prank have had another payoff for the author? Could there have been some monetary benefit to Conan Doyle? A motive strangely missing from every single other suspect. For Arthur Conan Doyle was in the midst of writing one of his most famous novels. 
This classic of science fiction is the story of British adventurers who discover living dinosaurs and cavemen on a remote South American plateau. Perhaps not coincidentally, The Lost World was not only written during the same period as the Piltdown Finds, the book was sent to its publisher in exactly the same week that the Piltdown Man was revealed to the public. Could the savvy author have been using the Piltdown hoax as a publicity stunt for his own novel? According to some scholars, the creator of Sherlock Holmes may have left clues to the Piltdown mystery throughout the text of The Lost World. When a map of the Lost World and a map of Sussex are superimposed, many of the details are startlingly similar. And the exact center of the Lost World map corresponds to a gravel field in Sussex, a gravel field known as Piltdown. When Arthur Conan Doyle died in 1930, the Piltdown Man had been an established and accepted scientific fact for nearly 20 years. If the creator of Sherlock Holmes was indeed the hoaxer, he must have died with a smile on his face. But the satisfied smile of a successful hoaxer is often accompanied by the bitter frown of the hoaxed. Years of work, thousands of dollars, and untold personal emotional investment were wasted by the Piltdown hoax. There are several mysteries of the Piltdown man. The first and most prominent mystery is, of course, who did it? Was it Charles Dawson? the amateur archaeologist with a hunger for fame? Was it Sir Arthur Keith, the brilliant anatomist with an evolutionary agenda? Could it have been Father Tillard de Chardin, the young priest who went on to become an important ethicist? Was it the humorous zoologist Martin Hinton playing a prank? Or the famous novelist Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, revenging himself on a self-satisfied scientific establishment? Or could it have been someone altogether different? Someone whose motives and opportunities are still unknown today? One of the amazing things about it is that at least 20 different people have been accused of being the Piltdown forger. An unsolved hoax will always draw in many suspects. One possible suspect can definitely be eliminated. Sir Arthur Smith Woodward. For 20 years after the initial discovery, the eminent paleontologist spent every summer digging for new finds at the Piltdown site. Long after Dawson, Tiard, Keith, Hinton, and all the others had died or moved on, Professor Woodward kept devoting his summers to the search for the Piltdown Man. He never found another fossil there. When Piltdown was revealed to be a fraud, Professor Woodward was already nine years in his grave. The 20 wasted years of an eminent professor's life are perhaps an object lesson in the emotional and very personal cost of the Piltdown hoax. The exposure of uh, the Piltdown as a fraud, not a hoax. A hoax has too much of a merry-hearted, prankish thing about it, and I don't like that. It was a fraud. This is part of what makes the whole Piltdown thing disgusting. People think it's a joke. Piltdown was no joke. Piltdown wasn't funny. This is the sort of thing. It wasted untold amounts of energy in the scientific community. Aside from besmirching 
the names of these people that were involved in it. It was no joke, and it annoys me to hear people treat it as a joke. The Piltdown Man was a serious embarrassment to British science and to the scientific world in general. But one of the lessons of the fraud was that science ultimately triumphed. The scientific method is a self-correcting organism. Once laboratory tests proved that the Piltdown Man did not in reality exist, he was stricken from the fossil record. But the Piltdown hoax raises a disturbing question. Are other accepted scientific truths actually falsehoods? What other cherished facts of science might eventually be proven wrong? What other Piltdown men are falsely enshrined in the pantheon of science? Almost certainly, we will discover the roots of other scientific mistakes, misconceptions, and hoaxes when we journey in search of history. Music